Well, good evening and welcome to Virtue and Valor. My name is Jason, and I am excited to get into God's Word with you tonight. I want to say hello to our our different satellite campuses that are joining us. We're blessed that you're joining us here for a time in God's Word as one big family, one church, and a lot of different locations. So we are going to get right into God's Word uh, tonight. As you know, we have been going through a series all about the life of Esther. What an amazing story. Tonight we're in chapter 4, and if we were going to call this title, this sermon, anything, it would be, um, who knows? Who knows? That's the name of it, okay? Who knows? Uh, I know what it is, but it's who knows uh, is the title for the sermon tonight. Growing up, there were a lot of times things would happen to my friends, and I would say, man, you're lucky. That's just not fair. You know, there's no way that that would ever happen to me. We use that word a lot growing up. It's you're lucky, or that's a coincidence. There's no way that just happened. I mean, that is a crazy coincidence. The more and more I've grown up, not only just in age, but in the Lord, I've come to realize, you know, there is no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as the roll of the dice or just the luck of the draw. Uh, it's really not coincidence, but it's providence is what we have come to see, you know, from our Bible. It's not that things just happen in life and that's how things turn out willy-nilly. This is the hand you got dealt. But we know rather there is a, a heavenly father that is in charge, that is literally governing everything around us, everything that happens to us on a daily basis. I want to let you know tonight, family, listen, there's not a single thing that you have ever experienced or gone through or that has come your way that has not been outside of the grand plan of God. God is in control. God is ruling and reigning. He is in control of the big events in your life, some of the great moments. He's even in control of those low moments, those devastating, knock the feet out from underneath you moments in your life. He's in control of the big things and also, yes, the little things. Now, we don't get a better really snapshot of this in any other location than right here in the book of Esther, where we see God really working out the details to a story to accomplish a great end. When I read through the book of Esther, I see God's hand all over it. Even though, as we are told by Pastor Greg, that the name of God is not mentioned in the book, we see God all throughout the book. We see God's hand involved in every decision. We see God raising up and putting down and putting out. We see the Lord involved in every single aspect of this book, the book of Esther, and it just goes to remind me that God is involved in every detail of my life. And it brings me a great sense of comfort. Tonight, I'm hoping we walk away with really a, a different perspective of God's involvement in our life. And seeing it that not that God is detached, but that God is near. Not that God is unaware, but God is closer than you could ever imagine. The Lord loves you. He's with you. He'll never leave you. And he's working out all things in your life for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, in the book of Esther, we have already read about a big turn of events that took place. Chapter 3, we learn about some bad news that went down. There was a, a wicked man who had a bad plan. His name was Haman. He was on some type of ego trip, and he wanted to not only take out the guy that had caused him a little bit of grief, but he wanted to take out an entire people group. Haman, being a little deceiver, this con artist took a plan to the king and said, why don't we destroy an entire people group? As a result, I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to give you a lot of gold. You're going to be rich king. And the king bought this. I'm not sure exactly how it happened or what was said, but King Ahasuerus decided to go ahead and agree to the extinction of the Jewish people. He signed on the dotted line. He put the stamp of approval on it, and he sent it out to 127 different provinces. All of a sudden, within, it would seem, a matter of just one night, the news rang out headlining 
You're all going to die a year from now. 365 days to sleep on it. It became aware all throughout his empire just exactly what was going to happen. Now, that was chapter 3. Chapter 4 is the response to that well, really bad news. And what we see is that it wasn't a shock to God. This wasn't God, oh no, I can't believe it. Are you kidding me? They're going to kill the Jews. What are we going to do? God wasn't shocked. Just like God's not shocked by the events going on in your life when it comes your way, when you hear the bad news, God is involved in the details. He was already at work in planning a solution to the problem before they even saw what was coming their way. And so we get to see just exactly what God was doing here in chapter 4 as a response to really the enemy's plans. This was the enemy's plan all along. And what was God doing behind the scenes to prepare for such a great victory? If you're there in Esther chapter 4, we're going to look through the story tonight. And I would like to point out and highlight some of the standout moments that really jumped off the page to me as I was reading it. Now, I'm going to give these six standout moments uh, a D word that goes with it. So six D words that I am going to use to really describe what happens here in Esther chapter 4. Starting off right in the beginning, I would say the first D I see is the word devastation. They were devastated. If you're there in verse 1, look what it says. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. He went out into the midst of the city, and he's crying out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one could enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. The king didn't want to literally look at anybody that was mourning or not dressed appropriately. And so he held him at bay, had him at distance. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Needless to say, these Jews were devastated by the news that they had just heard. Now, we saw what they were doing. Literally, they hear about it, and they start weeping and wailing. They're putting on sackcloth, this itchy type of, like, potato sack. They've got ashes they're putting on their head. They're making, really, a, an obvious declaration. We cannot believe what just happened. Are you kidding me? This is not real. We're not okay with it. And now they're taking it, uh, really, live. They're taking it public. So they're not just keeping it inward. They're making it outward. They're absolutely devastated. Now, maybe some of you could relate to this. You know, in my life, my aunt, I've had a few of them that have passed away. One of them was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I remember the doctors telling her that she only had a certain amount of time to live. Maybe there's some of you, you've heard this news before. You've got a year to live. You've got six months to live. You've got six weeks to live. And it seems like a tidal wave of devastation that comes your way. There's, what? Are you kidding me? And this is what the Jews were feeling. They're feeling overwhelmed, over their head, and they don't know what to do. And it drives them from really devastation to the second point. It drives them to, well, dependence. They say, we have no hope. What are we going to do? Verse 3, look what they do. They not only are just running around and causing a riot and lighting things on fire. They're, verse 3, they're mourning among the Jews with fasting weeping, wailing, laying in sackcloth and ashes. They not only just are moping in the corner, kind of throwing a pity party, they're not only doing that, but they're deciding to take it to the source to which a real solution can come about. They say, you know what? We need God. We need God right now. That's what we need. And it forces them to their knees. Literally, they go to the posture of prayer. They go to start fasting. Fasting being one of the greatest postures of prayer where you're neglecting something, a bodily need, or maybe an addiction to social media. Uh, you know, you're neglecting something, saying, God, I don't want to be distracted. I want to focus on you. These Jewish people were willing to give up to focus on God. God, we need you right now. If you don't show up, we're gone. And so this now attitude of dependence is all throughout the provinces. 
When I read on, I find something interesting take place. Verse 4, so Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take a sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. So the queen now hears about it. The people are mourning and weeping and wailing, and Mordecai is even doing the same thing, and she hears in a roundabout way through rumor, and she's like, what? There's no way. They're going to kill the Jews? This is fake news, people. There's no way. You know, she can almost, there's, there's no chance. She can almost not, not even believe it. She then decides, well, let's just see how serious this is. She's going to try to cover it up. Maybe she can brighten up old Mordecai with a pair of new duds, right? Give him some new shoes, some new clothes, put a smile on his face, and Mordecai is like, no, this ain't happening. Mordecai now enters the scene. So we've got the Jewish people devastated, dependent, but now we've got a man that is determined. I like Mordecai in this story. He really stands out to me. I believe that in this story and in the life of Esther, Mordecai is the unsung hero. Without Mordecai being the man that he was, Esther would have never been the woman that she was. Oh, look at it with me. He's not accepting any type of article of clothing. He's not going anywhere. Verse 5, Esther calls one of those eunuchs that was attending to her, and she gave him a command. Well, go find out from Mordecai what's happening. In verse 6, he goes to Mordecai, almost in secret. What's happening, man? Tell me, tell me. And Mordecai, he now comes with determination, the third point. He's determined. He's going to do something about the situation. He's not just mourning. He's not just dependent. He's now in action. This is a determined man. And so he goes with Literally, it would seem papers in hand, ready to give accurate information of the circumstance. He says, Mordecai told him all that had happened, the sum of the money that Haman had promised, verse 7, to pay into the king's treasuries, to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her that he might command her to go into the king, make supplication to him, and plead before him for her people. Oh, you got to love Mordecai. Mordecai is so bold and so amazing in this setting, he's not only approaching his, well, distant relative here, the girl that he has raised, but he's thinking, look, I'm not willing to sit by and watch my people die. I am not willing to do nothing. I'm going to do everything in my power. I'm going to exhaust all of my resources. I'm going to go through all of my contacts in my phone. That's right, I'm going to Esther. And so he charges to the palace. He brings all of the supplies. And then he starts giving instructions to this eunuch of what he needs to tell Esther, what she needs to go do. He's like, listen, you need to tell her to do this. No, no, focus with me, bro. You need to tell her, go in, talk to the king, command him. She, he's commanding the eunuch to go command Queen Esther on what she needs to do. Now, this is next level type of dedication. If our culture only had more Mordecais, I don't know why we live in such a culture where we're afraid to stand up against wrong, to stand for truth. Like, where are all the men with backbones again? Where have they gone? It seems like today we've got a bunch of spineless jellyfish type of men that are afraid to confront the culture. They're afraid to say what is right and what is wrong, regardless of what might come their way or consequence or recompense. It doesn't matter. Where are the Mordecais of today? Without Mordecai being this type of man ready to take action, I promise you Esther would have never moved. And that's exactly what we start to see. We see that Esther responds in a way very typical of us all. The next D I see here is that Esther responds defensively, almost dodgingly. Look at what happens here. So he tells her, go, you need to go in, talk to the king. And Esther then takes the words from Mordecai, verse 9, gives some new words to Hacketh, 
And verse 11 here is Esther's response. Well, I mean, all of the king's servants and all the people, I mean, they, they all know no man or woman can go into the inner court of the king who hasn't been called. Like, this isn't even possible. You can't do that. I mean, there's one law. You'll be put to death. I mean, unless he holds out the golden scepter to you. But I haven't even been called these last 30 days myself to go into the king. Excuses is exactly what Esther gives. So Mordecai comes on strong and Esther's like, are you kidding me? Oh, there's no way. Oh, no, no, no. Hacketh, listen, listen, listen. Everybody knows. I mean, what if I die? What if I break a nail? You know, what, what if something happens and I look bad or I lose my head? There's just no way I can't do it. It's just a bunch of buts and ifs and ands and no. And this dodging type mentality is so prevalent today. Where, oh no, it's, it's, it's not my, my battle. That's not my hill to die on. It doesn't really concern me. I mean, what if someone gets mad? What if I, I don't know, offend somebody? Oh man, I mean, what if I get sued? It seems like we have all been guilty of this attitude that Esther was showing. But Mordecai, he comes in even stronger. You have to love Mordecai. Mordecai takes this and he pushes back with a threefold argument. So I can imagine Hacketh hearing it from Esther and then taking it to Mordecai. Well, listen, Mordecai, listen. Okay, buddy. Well, Esther says that she doesn't want to die and, and now you can see Mordecai like, are you kidding me? There is no way. Like, is this my girl? Did I raise her? There is no way this is happening. And look what Mordecai responds with. This is incredible. I love this. Mordecai, verse 13, he says, you better go tell her, do not think in your heart that you can escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Then this is the next D, by the way. He's declaring truth. He's declaring it. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. This is going to happen. But you, in your father's house, you will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe God's at work. You see what he did in the very beginning there in verse 13? The first thing he does is he calls out passivity. He goes, excuse me? She said, what? He calls out passivity. This is your problem. Don't think because you're behind the palace doors live in the plush life with your velvety slippers that you will not be held to the guillotine just like the rest of the Jews. Your tail is on the cutting board as well here. We're in this together, Esther. Don't be passive. Then he points and reminds of responsibility. He says, look, I don't accept passivity. You better accept responsibility. You are capable of doing something, Esther. You should do something. Matter of fact, the blood is going to be on your hands if you don't. He says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, it'll come from another place, but you and your father's house, you're going to perish. Reminding us that those in high authority are held to greater responsibility. She needed to move. And Mordecai didn't back down. This is what you need to do. He had two negatives and then one positive. He said, now, look to the possibilities here. Not only should you not be passive, but you should be very responsible. And now look to what is possible. He says, who knows, Esther? Baby girl, listen up. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, God has been at work in the details in your life for such a time as this. Maybe this entire thing was brought about so that you could speak up. Mordecai, standing strong, declaring 
what is true. Men, I'm telling you right now, if you would brave the crowds and the opposition and stand for what is true and right and oppose the culture, we would see real change happen. Jesus had 12 guys. Listen, if we lived like a Mordecai, there's no doubt in my mind we would turn the United States upside down. If we would just simply be unafraid, unashamed of the gospel, of the truth, of the things that represent God and the kingdom, if we would not be afraid to stand out in the workplace or at home or in our neighborhood, if we would not shy away but charge ahead and have this strong confidence, say, no, this is what is right. I'm not going to be passive. I'm going to be responsible. And maybe, just maybe, God's at work and he's going to do something. Oh, I'm praying that God would raise up more Mordecai's, because look what happens. Look what happens when Mordecai does what he's supposed to do. Esther makes a decision. She goes from being defensive to now dedicated. She makes a decisive decision to do something about the circumstance. Look what happens in verse 16. She hears about it and she says, okay, Go, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Don't eat, don't drink for three days, night and day. My maids and I, we're going to do the same. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. But if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. I'm going down in a blaze of glory. Like, I'm going down, and it don't matter. No one's going to stop me. This is not an apology. This is not like a wormy, oh, okay, maybe I'm going to go in and see how it goes with the king. Like, no, she's like, if I die, then I die. I'm willing. His courage became contagious. Mordecai, willing to stand up for what is right, became contagious to his offspring. Those in his family. Listen, when you make a stand in the home as a mom or a dad, I promise you this, your kids are watching. When you're squirmy and wormy with no backbone in the home, your kids are watching. Don't be shocked when they replicate what you're putting out. But you should be proud when you're making a stand and being a witness for Christ and doing what is right and being a man and a woman of integrity. Listen, it becomes contagious. Something happens in the Christian life. When I look to a man of God that is doing the right thing in this wicked day and age, I look to him and I go, yes, yes. That's what I want to be. That's what I look up to. Would we not be pleased? Would we be the men and the women of God that are not compromising, that we're not giving in, we're not allowing compromise to be commonplace, making our character be that which is a catastrophe, where we are boldly saying, we will not back down, we will not give in, we will charge ahead and stand on what is right, we will declare truth, and guess what will happen? Other people will see, other believers will watch, and maybe just maybe they'll follow suit. I love how Esther responds. She's all in. Now we're talking about this girl. She says, okay, all right, I'm all in. We're gonna do this. Uh, Well, I can't go forward without God's favor. So look it, if I'm going to go see the king, then you better go seek God on my behalf. So you better go pray and fast three days. I don't want you even sipping a soda, all right? Nothing. Like you need to just be on your face before God because I need all of God's favor right now to do what he's calling me to do. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe God's at work. When I read this story, I can't help but just think, where are the Esthers? Where are the Mordecais? If there was just one, there was one in this day, I think our culture would be all the more better for it. If there was just two, three, if this church, family, you, if you would live men as a Mordecai, you ladies as an Esther, if you would be bold and confident, and again, as I've said again and again, and stand for truth, 
There is nothing that this world could ever do to stop us. Two principles that I see from our text to pull away. One, all throughout this story, I see a dependence for God's deliverance. Dependence on God's deliverance. The second thing I see here is that there is a strain of confidence in his providence. So I see the Jews in the beginning, Mordecai, Esther, then the Jews again, being dependent on God. They fast, they're weeping, they're praying, they fast again. They're saying, God, we can't do this without you. There is something we need to remember about our Christian life. We can't do anything without God. Like, let me just say it. I don't know why it is that most people only call out to God when the bottom falls out. But the truth of the matter is this. We can do nothing in this life without God. You can't. You can't live tomorrow without God. We are absolutely in need for God to show up in our life every single day. We are to be dependent for his deliverance. If God doesn't come through in your life, you're gone. You're a goner. Like, I need God daily to show up in my life. Like, God, listen, I need you. And if I don't have you, Lord, I'm, I'm as good as gone. The reason why we have such a hard time recognizing this is because of deep-rooted pride. I mean, think about it. How often do you really pray? How often are you truly dependent on God? The reason why you have a hard time praying is because of how independent you think you are. If you really believe God to be your source of deliverance, then you would talk to him a lot more. But the main reason why you don't is because you don't think you need him. Life is good. Listen, you got here tonight because of God. You're going to go home tonight safely because of God. The heart beating in your chest with no batteries, God. Tomorrow morning you wake up, God. The job you have tomorrow, God gave it to you. The family you have, God. Every possession you have, God. There is nothing you will ever give that has not been first received from God. And these people were dependent upon God. Something big came their way. It knocked the breath out of them. And they said, God, we need you to show up. Listen, if you're going through something tonight, go to God. You can depend on him. God will show up in a powerful way. Whether he heals you here or heals you in heaven, he does heal. Whether he provides for you now or he ultimately provides for you in heaven, he does provide. Whether he protects you now or protects you eternally in heaven, he always protects. You can depend on God, family. And you should depend on God, just like we see these characters here doing. And this is exactly what the Bible tells us. I mean, we've got a witness all throughout Scripture that Abraham said he was not going to have kids if it weren't for God. Joseph was not going to make it through the prison or interpreting dreams without God. Moses, to Pharaoh, plagues, a Red Sea road, manna in the wilderness, and water from a rock. We're talking David and Goliath, God. We're thinking Samson, God. Gideon's 300, the widow's oil that continued, calming the storms, feeding 5,000. Oh, you can't look throughout the Bible and not say God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God. Daniel, Lion's Den, God. When tragedy strikes, run to God. He will come through, and that's exactly what the Jews did this day. They said, the bottom's fallen out, it's time to call out. Now, the reason why I make a big point about this is because it's time that we come together and pray as well. Fervent is this coming Saturday. We're having a church-wide prayer meeting. We're going to go call out to God together. Listen, change in this country will not happen unless God does it first. It's going to take us believers going and saying, God, we need you, dependent on you. God, you can do this. And so we're calling for a church-wide prayer meeting. And the only thing that would keep you back from that would be the thing that keeps us from prayer, that is pride. The second thing I th see in this text, our characters here had a sh an amazing confidence in God's providence. They had a confidence in God's providence. Now that word confidence comes from a Latin word, confide. 
The word con means with and fide means faith. It's with faith is what confidence means. Providence means God's control, his sovereignty. It's saying, I've got faith in the fact, trust in the fact that God is in control. He's in control. The people in this story, they believed God to be in control. And that is why we see such courage. When you believe your God to be in control, when you have a confidence in his providence, there will be nothing that will ever stop you. There will be no hardship that will slow you down. There will be no resistance that will even cause you to halt. But you will run ahead. He says, who knows? Such a time as this. If I perish, I perish. There is a sense of recklessness. There is a risky type of living when you really genuinely believe that your God has got you and that he's not going to let you go, that he's going to protect you, that you are literally indestructible until he's done with you. It's amazing when you really genuinely think about God's timing and God's planning. Here Esther was placed for such a time as this. But what about you? What about me? I want to tell you tonight, it's not by accident that you are where you are at. I mean, even the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, it says that God has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. Meaning, God put you here in the United States at this time, instead of being born in like China 500 years ago, God has determined pre-appointed times and the boundaries of your dwelling. God says, I'm putting you here at this time with this family. Yeah, that's right. With that family, with those neighbors at this workplace for such a time as this. God is involved in the little details in your life. He's involved in the big details. You don't plan your birthday and you don't plan your death day, but God does. God plans every detail of your life and he is bringing you to such a spot around such a people that you, you would open your mouth. You would be a witness, that you would be a light for such a time as this. Who knows, maybe God's at work. Who knows, maybe God wants to do something in and through you. Does not the Bible tell us that a man's heart plans his way but God directs his steps? And our memory verse this week, is it not Ephesians 2.10? That God is planning good works, that we would walk in them? Oh, if we don't see this tonight, we could potentially miss it. God put us where we're at for such a time as this. When your heart is dependent on God, you can confidently charge ahead. There's no risk. There's no worry. And I even got to thinking about this. Like, why don't we do more as a Christian church? I mean, think about all the lost out there. If we're just talking about gospel proclamation or church preservation, either one, why don't we do more as a church? Like, why don't you individually do more? Why is it that you rarely share your faith? Why is it that you rarely have joyful encounters with God that cause you to do things out of the norm, like real ministry? Why is it that we shy away from criticism and potential persecution? Why is it that these things are happening? Here's the reason. You don't want to know why? It's because you don't actually believe your God to be in control. And you don't actually believe his word to be true. If I really genuinely believed that heaven was secure and no one was going to take it from me, guess what happened? I would live a risky life. I would go big for the kingdom of God. I would take gigantic leaps of faith going, look, I got nothing to fail. I mean, if I die, I die. Who cares, right? I mean, I'm going to heaven anyway. You live with risk. You go, I'm going big. I'm betting the farm. Like, let's do this right now. Like, that is the type of faith that comes when you genuinely believe the word of God to be true and your God to be in control. Oh, if something Body, please, tonight would get this in your soul. I promise you, you'll turn Riverside upside down. Your workplace tomorrow, your family, your God is in control. You're safe. Don't let fear stop you. If there's an open road, don't stop at the devil's caution tape. Like, charge ahead. Go through. 
don't let fear or anxiety or the what ifs or the oh no, I mean, ah, ah, I, e, oh, I don't know, ah, le, 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 le. you know, like what? Don't let anything stop you or hold you back. Let's be believers that just believe the word of God to be true and our God to be in control, a real confidence in God's providence. Let's stand in his promises and run in his protection for such a time as this. There's no better time than now. We have been placed here to band together, link shields and arms to make much of Jesus. God was at work in Esther. He was preserving the Jews, and so she needed to speak up. Today, God is at work in the preservation of the church at large, and it is our job to speak up. And I think the primary way that we would speak up would be with gospel proclamation. Declaring what is true and right, that we've got a risen Savior, that we've got a, an amazing God that loves the world and has proven that through the death, burial, and resurrection of his Son. Our job is to proclaim. I want to say that the things you have in this life that God has given you, you need to leverage those things for church preservation and gospel proclamation. I believe the rich have riches, princes have power, wise people have wisdom for such a time as this. If you're not using your resources, your finances, your wisdom, your strength, your ability, your natural giftings, your supernatural giftings, for such a time as this, you are wasting them. You are burying those talents in the dirt and you will be held accountable before God. God has given us all ability and if we would use them, oh my word, the gates of hell would have no, no chance. That's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus is all about the church preservation. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates don't go anywhere. They're, they're defensive because the church is on the move. And it's saying when the church comes together and we're on the move and we're charging ahead, man, no gates ain't going to stop us. Like we're breaking through. You know, we're rescuing those people that are lost, that are gone. But if we would just band together, that is the point. Now, the big pull away that I see from our text tonight, and I'm done. When I read Esther's story, I think this. Esther's situation reminds me of Emmanuel's sacrifice. Esther's situation, her circumstance, it reminds me of a greater than Esther. Like Esther, it was amazing what she did. She went to the king. We know the story. She doesn't die. God gives her favor with the king and the Jews get saved. It's pretty epic. Like, wow, let's make an amazing movie about this. And they did. And this is, this is great. That's why it's one of the most epic Bible stories we have. But listen, there's a greater than Esther here. There's an Emmanuel. Jesus, our king, he didn't just come in and go before God. He came on mission to die. Like our Emmanuel, God with us, to the greatest degree was our mediator. We were suffering impending doom. We were going to hell in a handbasket. We should be in hell yesterday, by the way, because of how bad we are. But our God so loved us, he sent Jesus, the mediator, to come in to live a perfect life and to go to the cross with the intent of death and then to rise again. Esther is amazing, but oh, our Jesus is amazing. I am so thankful for what Jesus has done. And how Esther points us to him. For such a time as this, family, for such a time as this, can I just say it over you? Listen, who knows? Maybe God's at work in each and every one of your lives. Who knows? Maybe he's doing something. There's no coincidence. This isn't happenstance or by chance. Who knows? Maybe God wants to do something through you. Maybe he wants to use you. Who knows? Maybe it's for such a time as this. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we say thank you. 
We say thank you, Jesus, for the fact that we in you have forgiveness and the hope of heaven when we die. We've got promises that we can stand on that you are God, you are in control, you are holding us in your hand, and no one can pluck us out. God, I pray that you would embolden us tonight, that you would help these men and women be Mordecai's and Esther's, that we would stand strong in a dark and wicked day, that we would confidently declare truth, that we would seek the preservation of the church and the proclamation of the gospel. Oh God, we love you and thank you and say, Lord, would you use us, our lives, for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.